So, as I mentioned, the first session is a macroeconomic view of China, and I think it should give us a great foundation to build our knowledge on China. And we have two wonderful speakers. Bing Liu is a Trade Commissioner, Commercial Council of Austrade Australian Consulate General in Shanghai. Bing took up this position in August of 2012. Prior to arriving in Shanghai, Bing had worked in similar roles in both Guangzhou and Beijing at the Australian Consulate Guangzhou and Australian Embassy in Beijing, respectively, from 2004 to 2012. Bing is currently the post manager of Austrade East China Network of Offices, providing business opportunities and services for Australian entities in trade, education, and inward investment. And Hai Bing Zhu, who is the Chief China Economist, Head of Greater China Economic Research for JP Morgan. Hai Bing joined JP Morgan in September. Prior to that, he had worked as an economist at the Bank of International Settlements for 10 years. At the BIS, Hai Bing wrote research on various research topics, such as the interlinkage between the financial system and the real economy, risk management, and bank regulation, the China economy, and real estate cycles. Both will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes each, and then we'll open the session to questions. Please welcome Bing to the podium. Thank you, Tom. And distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great honor to be standing here and to be invited to attend this, um, this conference. Um, it is a, a long-awaited delegation for financial services. As the leader for the financial services team in Austria, we have long wanted to have many, many Australian financial services players to come to China to understand the China situation and to share with China your experience and your knowledge and to improve the financial sector in China. So I can't uh, tell you how excited I am over the last few months with the increasing amount of Australian financial services delegations coming to China. So thank you all for coming. Um, there is a very comprehensive and uh, excellent program put together by AIST. And so for me today, it's going to be a very lighthearted section. Basically, I'll focus on talking about uh, the trade between Australia and China and what Australia can help um, in the process to increase your uh, presence in China or help to uh, look for opportunities for you in China. Okay, usually we'll have um, five sections um, in the presentation. We'll talk about reform, um, talk, about, talk about economic landscape of the, all the big numbers, which I will repeat some of them just to impress you. Uh, we will talk about the trade between Australia and China, and we'll talk about some uh, sector opportunities across the field sector and explain our, um, just using that to explain our network, how Australia is structured in China. And the last section will be doing how do we do business in China, just very briefly, because it's a big topic. Any of the topic, we can spend a day talking uh, talking about them. So for example, the reforms that you have a section right after this session for a whole hour talking about Chinese government reform. So they, I won't go into the, uh, the details, but just give you some overhead um, uh, information or just uh, some headings for you to remember when you follow up in the future uh, sections. Okay, everyone knows who that is? That's the President Xi. And so um, in China, as so we know, government plays a decisive role um, over many, many years. And so the, in the Chinese enterprise, they usually tell you that it's most important to make money, follow the government. So if you want to make good money in China, you have to understand the government policies and where the government's emphasis is going to be on for the next five or 10 years. And usually it's announced at the beginning when the new government is formatted. So the new government was established last year in um, October, and she is the president, Xi Jinping, and Li Keqiang is the premier. So we call it Xili government. So for this slide, you don't have to remember all, all the information, So, but there is a commitment uh, to um, market economy, to build a modern uh, market economy in China, which that they, for the first time they've announced that market uh, 
is a decisive force in the economic development of China in the future. So under that heading, you will see that there is a, a number of different um, actions taken by the government, including state-owned enterprises um, reform, including uh, growing the private sector, including financial sector reform, and also including fiscal reform and sustainable development for the first time the key agenda and environmental protection is also a main focus of the new government. Um, the second sector I mentioned, I'm going to give you some very big numbers about China, which you probably already know about or read about. Um, so it's about, it's um, the the major global economic and trading power at the moment is currently the world's second largest economy, largest trading economy, second largest destination of foreign direct investment, largest manufacturer, and largest holder of foreign exchange reserves. With 1.35 billion population, 618 million internet users, 1.25 billion mobile phone users, so almost the entire population has mobile phones, and out of these 1.25 billion mobile phone users, 490 million are 3G users, and 838 million mobile phone internet users. There are 420 million internet shoppers, and over 100 cities with a population over 100 million. It is predicted that over um, 320 million middle classes population earning more than 20,000 US dollars annual salary by 2020. At the same time, China will also have over 300 million aging population at the age of 65 and above by 2030. So what are the major challenges we can see? Is the, so there's some headings for you to consider over the next few days or over the next 10 days. There's lots of discussion on these challenges. So we are industry over capacity. In some of the industry, it will be 30 to 50 percent over capacity. There's a huge aging population emerging in major cities, especially Shanghai. 27 percent of aging population um, in Shanghai. So one in every three Shanghainese is above 60 years old at the moment. Um, also, there is a reduced labor force due to the one-child policy, and it's significantly related to this group is the inefficient financial sector currently in China. So there's a big list of challenges that many people can talk about, but in the financial sector, such as the shadow banking, such as the, um, the inefficiency of the, the sector, um, and many other um, internet banking, etc., they generate creating lots of issues in China as well. So you will hear a lot about them in the future, in the next few days as well. Okay, the next session is about Australia trade with China. Also, very impressive big numbers here. Uh, first, we talk about this year, which is a, a very fresh number just come out of the press. Is the two-way trade has uh, is achieved, has achieved about 150.9 billion um, this calendar year in uh, last calendar year in 2013. It's about 21 percent increase from last year. It actually is 23.3 uh, percent of Australia's total trade. Australia is the um, the seventh largest supplier to China. Uh, China accounts for about 15% of Australia's total imports. China is, the, is also the largest supplier for Australia. And Australia is China's seventh largest supplier. Australia contributes to 4.3% of China's total import goods and services in 2012. For um, Australia, um, China is the number one largest export destination of Australia, both in goods and services. So in goods, it's about 101.6 billion Australian dollars. It's 28% uh, increase from last year. And the total import um, 
uh, import from China to Australia is about 49.3 billion Australian dollars, is about 6% increase from last year. And it accounts about 15% of Australia's total imports. And China um, remains Australia's largest services export market in 2013, value at about 6.9 billion. Um, it's 12.5 percent of Australia's total services import, <coughs> in, uh, export. Sorry, and China is a major investor of Australia industry, and, and for the first time uh, in 2013, Chinese investment in Australia was not concentrated in the mining sector. Instead, the power transmission industry dominated the state grill deal, accounting for 40 percent of the total investment value in 2013 followed by mining, of course, 24%, gas, 21%, commercial real estate, 14%, and agribusiness, 1%. This is the pie chart for the investment into Australia, which I think will generate a significant uh, opportunity for financial services sectors. However, the total um, Chinese investment into Australia only accounts for about 2% of total foreign direct investment into Australia. So it's a highly significant. Okay, some sector opportunities. Um, this on this part, I'm just going to briefly um, talk about uh, the, how we divided our team because we believe to marry Australian capabilities and the Chinese opportunity, we basically divide the team, the trade team, into six sectors, and plus the education team has a separate team doing education promotion. Um, and then the investment team attracting Chinese investment into, Austra uh, into Australia. So for the trade team, promoting um, bilateral trade, we have divided into six teams, including food and beverage and consumer goods, healthcare and age and senior living, um, green energy and mining and, and resources, building and construction and advanced manufacturing, and financial services and services. So those six centers, we believe, have significant opportunities that for Australian companies to be operating or engaging in the China market. Um, I, will go, I won't go into the details on, on each sector, but you're welcome to ask questions on if you're interested in any particular sector. Of course, every sector we can talk about the opportunities for half a day or all the, all a day. Okay, um, the last session is about doing business in China. That's where Australia comes in and can help with, uh, with, you, uh, with your development in China. Firstly, is the China, like we talk about, make money, follow the government's policies. So what does the Chinese government want from the foreign companies such as Australia? It's more technology in more innovation. Less labor-intensive industry, more energy saving, and less pollution technologies. So you might mention protection technologies, new technologies, new innovation products, etc. That's the government. Um, that's what the government wants from the foreign companies to come into China. And for key challenges, it's it's probably some of the challenges probably you will face in all the developing countries. Some is China, China unique. Like we talk about the human resource constraints, both with skill force or the number of labor is reducing. Um, there's the justice, the, or the legal system. There's no outsiders so talking about justice. The legal system is still developing. Sometimes can be a bit difficult to deal with, and very unclear uh, legal system and rules to follow. And this is environment, it's very opaque sometimes, and it gets very difficult, frustrated, it's lots of red pay, bureaucracy, cultural difference, language barriers, this is cultural difference and Chinese or Australian, Western and Eastern cultural differences is another factor. And intellectual property rights. It has improved the situation over the last 10 years. However, there is still a major concern on IP rights. So if your product is easily copied in China, consider your strategies. And so also domestic industry protections from a national to local level, which is commonly seen in developing countries. And the A rules. So you will hear about different advice on different rules, but uh, Tom has mentioned previously some key rules to follow is I, I emphasis on conduct research, um, find uh, consulting companies and do as much research as 
you can possibly do and obtain advice from companies already operating in China, already working in China. And my advice is like all, you, all of you are doing, come to China and experience China yourself. Um, through that, you will understand um, what China really is, right? instead of reading newspapers that give you know, media stories about China, which give you um, multiple advices, and so you get really confused. Um, the other uh, rules to follow, basically, is just practice common sense and, and follow a good business ethics, no corruptions, and zero tolerance on corruption from the Australian government, obviously. And, and be skeptical. So there's no good deals in China fall on top of your head. It usually doesn't happen. If you think it's too good to be true, then usually it is. And there's no wonderful deals. It's a very expensive market to come in. It's very competitive, but you have very good results long term. So you require lots of commitment before you can get to the results. So be a flexible and make sense for partnership. It's just common. Uh, uh, knowledge we all know when doing business. So how can Austria help you? Um, there's lots of words on the slide, but basically we we'll uh, summarize. Uh, we have uh, we have about 200 Austria staff uh, across 15 locations in the Greater China region, uh, including all the first tier cities and about uh, 11 second tier cities in China. So have the largest footprint footprint in China. Um, we also have um, a very good market insight because uh, we have, apart from about 10% of Australian based staff, 90% uh, of staff are long term local engaged staff uh, specialized in various commercial sectors. Uh, we have an extensive customer network. Probably the most important part is we have the government badge. You know how important government is to separate us from uh, normal commercial consultant agencies is the the federal government badge that we carry. Usually when you come, uh, come into some problems in China, uh, come to the government and so, uh, look for solutions. That's what I think keep Austria uh, value add is. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so i just going to say there's a few uh, things that we, we can help. One is buy missions to Australia to attend industry uh, functions or industry expos. Uh, business matching is a kind of uh, services that we offer for businesses. We also organize train missions to come to China, such as what AIST is doing, and we have, of course, ministerial visits, and we also have uh, market access issues where most companies will have uh, far it difficult to find decision makers, we can help using our government badge. Um, there is a few uh, case studies which we're going to play a video in a, in one minute. Just talk about how we can help with uh, building the Australian awareness and how we can help with business developing in China. And one of the uh, key successes we had was the with the fine food and say they in twenty. 13, we organized about 120 Chinese buyers and to Australia together with state office. We actually delivered uh, a, a significant business lease to those companies. And one of the companies actually signed up five business deals at the event. So it's quite significant um, success for them. Uh, we also have investment team helping with large Chinese investments into China. And this is what you're going to see in Beijing. The water cube is designed by an Australian company in partnership with Chinese, which is introduced by Austria as well. I think that this is our content number. I'm sorry we had to rush this. I'm very sorry. There's so much information that I want to share with you. But um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm just going to play a short video um, to show you the April visit uh, by, led by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Law. Minister Law. Thank you very much.
respect. The purpose of this trip is to seal the mutual trust and to establish further mechanisms that will deepen our strong strategic partnership. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here. And um, let me start from the uh, observation we had uh, one month ago. One month ago, we had a meeting in the Washington, D.C. for our investors. And, uh, so we have more than 400 uh, global investors at that time. And uh, the question, because we have a short survey down there, and the question we ask is that for 2012, what's the biggest risk on the, for the in the global economy. So we have roughly about 10, option, uh, 10 choices uh, for the global investor, including US QE tapering, uh, Russia, uh, the, the, the Ukraine, and also the Euro area uh, uh, development, and also China. And guess what? That uh, The top concern about uh, from the global investors is actually China economic slowing, and uh, also the China shell banking. Uh, about 35% of the investors put China as a, a top concern in their mind. So, uh, the, the, but the, the observation we have in that meeting is actually, when we ask people, say, how do you perceive the probability, say, China is going to have a hard landing this year or next year, or China will have financial crisis, actually very few people expect China will have a hard landing story. So the question, or the concern is more on the uncertainty of the transparency. And we know that uh, for China this year is the, the first year of the grand reform under new leadership. Uh, but we know that the economy started this year from a very uh, a weak start. Uh, from a market perspective, uh, what they feel uncomfortable is that it's not clear, say, how the new leadership, say, will respond to the economic weakness and what kind of policy response function they will have. And going ahead, say, we will try how the financial system probably addressed by the, the policy makers and the regulators. So these are the top concerns uh, by the, uh, in, from the market perspective. So in today's presentation, what I want to uh, go through, just give you a bird view that uh, what's going on in China and how you perceive that uh, uh, the, the policy uh, uh, will be adopted in China for this year and uh, how the economic outlook what kind of GDP growth we're expecting uh, for this, uh, and what's the biggest challenge uh, we will face uh, for this year. So let me, let me start from some uh, numbers. For the first quarter, uh, if you look at the GDP growth number, obviously that uh, uh, China has a very weak start. So the headline number uh, doesn't look that bad. If you look at the official number, year-over-year -year growth number, uh, first quarter China's GDP growth is 7.4. Uh, it's lower than compared to 7.7 in the last year, but uh, uh, slightly lower than the uh, 7.5 growth target for this year. But 7.4 is still quite decent number. But if you look at it in the other way, if you look at the quarter by quarter growth, what we call sequential growth, uh, which is affecting the growth momentum more timely way, at your first quarter is pretty worrisome. Here that the number we show is that it's below six below six percent quarter by quarter growth in the in the first quarter. And this is the weakest number since 2009. Okay, so the, the only quarter you can find is that in the last quarter, 2008, that's when the global financial crisis kicked in. China had a very weak start in that particular quarter. But other than that, 6% is almost weakest in, the, uh, in China's uh, recent years. And if you look at the more into details, uh, the weakness is uh, quite broad based. So traditionally, when we analyze China economic growth, we said that China has three major growth engines, right? Consumption, investment, and exports. But in all three areas, if you look at these charts, actually they all show different degree of softness. So here, let me start at the investment. Uh, the, uh, the, the solid line here is uh, the total excess investment. I mean, uh, in the first quarter, the growth rate started to decline, and mainly it's driven by the, uh, 
the weakness in the manufacturing investment and the real estate investment. So not surprising that uh, when we talk about the uh, China's economic situation, we're talking about overcapacity in the manufacturing sector. We also talk about recent weakness in the housing market, which I'll, I'll go through in a bit more detail in a few minutes. Consumption side, if you look at retail sale, as your retail sale growth dropped from 13% to 12% to, to at the beginning of this year. Again, almost uh, one of the lowest in recent years. And export, uh, let me put it here. Export, if you look at the official number, in the first quarter, China export growth actually was negative. Okay. So uh, last year, we're talking about 6 7% growth, but this year, uh, we start from minus 3, minus 4% at the beginning of this year. And on, on top of that, that, we have the adjustment in housing market. And housing, traditionally, has been a very important uh, growth driver in China. Last year, 2013, China's housing market was very, had very strong performance. But starting from earlier this year, you see that the house price starts to turn a rot. And the uh, housing transaction has been dropping very quickly, and the real estate investment also slowed up. So if you look at the all three pictures, investment, consumption, and the uh, uh, exports, all of them, they are weaker compared to last year. And also at the provincial level, uh, here I put these, uh, the 30 provinces in China, We don't have the data for that. Uh, here, the, the blue bar here shows that uh, last year economic growth in each province, and the red bar shows first quarter growth in this year for each province. So I don't want to go through detail, but a very clear message that in all 30 provinces, actually first quarter GDP growth is lower than last year growth. So it's, uh, it's broad based in all sectors and also broad based in all different, uh, different areas. So that's the situation we're facing. And so let me first explain say, why the first quarter data is so weak. Is there any particular reason? Is it because structure slowed down or is it because of the cyclical slowdown? So uh, my, my, my answer is that it's probably both, but uh, probably cyclical factors play a more important role than in the first quarter uh, numbers. There's several reasons why the, uh, uh, the first quarter data is particularly weak. Number one, I think the most important reason is that the change in the economic policy uh, starting from the end of last year. Uh, if you remember that uh, uh, the new leadership they came in actually in, uh, at the end of 2012, last year, uh, this is the first most important meeting actually uh, about economic policy we have in October. In, in November, we have this uh, third premier session uh, of the uh, new leaders, and they lay out this uh, reform agenda 60 areas, uh, 60 items, and the, 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 the reform agenda by before 2020. So, and also in the uh, December, they have this uh, annual Central Economic Working Conference. And in both meetings, they highlight that uh, under new leadership, that reform will receive a very high priority, and that's something they want to uh, make uh, concrete progress. So, if you look at the monetary policy and the fiscal policy, obviously there's a shift from pro-growth to economic reform in the fourth quarter of last year. So here, one particular measure we look at is that uh, the credit growth. Uh, that's uh, uh, indicator of the monetary policy in China. And here, the two chart, this chart shows the relationship between the economic growth and the, the credit growth. And the credit growth actually is uh, uh, led by two quarters. So the message here is that very close relationship between these two, meaning that China economy growth is very much credit-driven. Uh, but from credit growth to GDP growth, typically there was like two quarter lagging effect. Okay. That is the main message behind this chart. And if you look at this chart, obviously the credit growth, the credit policy has very substantial change from the second half of last year. The credit, uh, the credit growth at the, in the peak time last year, we're talking about 21, 22 percent, and this number came uh, right now about 16 percent. So. Not surprisingly, that uh, when credit growth slowed down, that will affect the uh, economic growth. And that's something we observed in the first quarter of this year. Okay. So this is the first reason that uh, the policy shift that focused a lot uh, more on the structural reform and the structural rebalancing. And that, uh, that caused the economic slowing. And second, that uh, on the external side, as I said, the, uh, the export growth is also pretty disappointing in the, in the first quarter. And of course, there's some reason that uh, it's because of the, uh, the what we know, the fake export phenomenon last year. And uh, the fake export story is that 
Now, if you remember what happened in 2013, China's export was very, was very strong, but it's not reflecting the true export uh, growth. In, in, but to some extent, because that, uh, uh, there's some cross-border sales, the capital inflow, the hot money inflow, uh, disguised as the as a trade, as a, as an export from China. And the reason is because China's onshore interest is much higher than offshore interest. And also, the Chinese yuan appreciated a lot last year. So there's an arbitrage opportunity for uh, uh, domestic and also the foreign investors. Uh, but at the same time, because China's capital account is very closed, so if you want to take advantage of this uh, uh, arbitrage opportunity, uh, many of them, they uh, basically over-reported the export number. So that's a, the, the channel they can uh, the, uh, move, shift the, uh, the capital inflow into China. And that kind of artificially uh, uh, increased the export number last year. So if you did follow the reason, but even if you adjust for this export, uh, the first quarter growth is still pretty weak. That's about 3 or 4%. Uh, still pretty low number by Chinese standard. Uh, but to some extent, it's related to uh, uh, the, the very weak uh, global demand, and particularly that in the U.S., uh, the first quarter economic performance is much weaker uh, than market expected, expected. The market was expecting that U.S. Uh, is on the way of uh, a modest recovery, so this year that the U.S. will grow somewhere between 2.5 and 3 percent. But if you think, if you look what happened in the first quarter in the U.S. Uh, because of cold weather or some other reasons, U.S. economy actually is the growth is flat, or probably even negative in the first quarter. We're still waiting for the final number. So that obviously is a, a very uh, important reason why China's export growth is also uh, disappointing in the first quarter. So these are the economic reasons, and obviously also the U.S. Uh, the story is more cyclical story. Because we believe that the U.S. economy will move up to back to 3% uh, uh, growth. So, but there are other non-economic reasons that uh, also play a very important role uh, for the uh, weak economic performance. Here just one, uh, two things. Uh, one is anti-corruption, and the second is the anti-pollution. Okay. So anti-corruption, anti I would say, it's, uh, again, both are, are a good thing in the longer term. But what I should point out is that, is that in the near term, both efforts or both campaigns actually they work hard economic growth. Right? Anti corruption is very obvious. Obviously, whether obviously you heard the retail sale, that's why retail sale in the first quarter uh, was particularly weak. And if you look at into the detail, actually some sectors relate to this anti corruption campaign. For example, high end consumption, uh, luxury goods, these are the most bad hits in the retail sale category. Right? And but also you know, on the ground, we also feel that anti corruption also start to affect economic activity for the reason that uh, right now the local government officials they're much more risk averse or they're much more cautious in doing things. So in the past that uh, uh, of the, the one of the one part of the China's high growth story is that they make local government officials behave like big a CEO of big companies. Right? So they have very strong incentive to support investment to support the, uh, the, the local companies. Uh, but when the anti-corruption intensified, well, they, they feel more reluctant. So nothing has delivered. Uh, that's the that's the additional reason I'll say for why uh, the anti-corruption also affects investment activity in China. Uh, anti-pollution again. That uh, here is a, uh, yeah, if you don't see actually, this is a Tiananmen Square. This is a forbidden city that uh, uh, you cannot see here. Uh, but uh, anti-pollution. Uh, even I would say that yeah, yeah. the, the, the story I would say is more supportive for Beijing, but it's affecting a lot of areas. And believe me, Beijing is not the worst city. There are a number of other provinces surrounding Beijing where air quality is even worse. Uh, even you should stay in Shanghai. Shanghai is relatively, I would say, uh, better compared to Beijing. But people here, if you live here, you still feel that uh, the, the pollution is getting much, much more serious in the last several years. So, in the so how is any pollution affecting these economic growth? Obviously, that for Chinese policy makers, uh, when the pollution is getting worse, uh, the easiest answer is just to temporarily shut down some factories, right? some big polluters. So if you, you look at the local, the provincial level GDP growth, uh, what you can find is that the biggest drop in the GDP growth here, let me highlight a few, is the Shenzhen province. 
Shenxi is the biggest coal producer in China, and also Hebei. Hebei is the, uh, the fog is surrounding Beijing, and a lot of heavy industries there, and also Heilongjiang. So these are the three provinces that you see the biggest decline in GDP growth. And obviously, obviously, the, the one important reason is that uh, the pollution problem. And the pollution is usually the worst in the winter season in China. If you look at the, uh, the, uh, the air quality index last year in China by months, actually January is the worst, but it's getting much better in the summer. So the anti-pollution, I would say, these are the mission measures to, to just forcefully shut down the factory that most likely happen in the winter. So that our yeah another story become the uh, the first quarter a uh, very weak number, uh, but again I will say uh, for this anti pollution campaign I personally don't expect it will be permanent shutdown. Uh, when now moving to the summer season I will say that many of the factories will be reopened and the uh, the anti pollution will be a long term uh, big challenge for Chinese economy growth. So here are the reasons uh, why the first quarter uh, is weak. And so what the government is trying to do, uh, obviously that uh, uh, the government want to, the, this new administration, they want to distinguish from the old administration. So what the, the, the very clear message they want to send is that, yeah, although the economy is in challenging environment, but we are not going to repeat what the previous administration has done. Basically, we're talking about large scale, demand side stimulus package, fiscal easing and monetary easing. Uh, they make very clear that uh, this is not going to happen this year. So, but instead, that uh, what they highlight, I would say, uh, three main areas. One, number one, is that uh, the target support in certain sectors. So, uh, growth is still a priority issues for the new leaders. Uh, so, but they say we're not going to support all the sectors. Uh, the sectors here the list that infrastructure, affordable housing, environmental protection, uh, social welfare, service industry, small business. Uh, these are the areas that government say they are going to provide more support, either by through the fiscal measures or the monetary policies. And the second component is that uh, uh, your fiscal policy and the monetary policy will be fine-tuned uh, to support. And again, fine-tuned is a very vaguely defined word in China, and it can be vary from almost no change in the policy to some more meaningful, very significant change in the policy. So. Uh, here, that uh, in the fiscal policy, uh, let, let me highlight that it's uh, it's very difficult for the central government to increase the fiscal deficit number. So, in that sense, that uh, the fiscal policy fine tuning is more e is easy to understand. We're basically talking about compositional shift. Compositional shift in the sense that uh, they will continue anti corruption campaign. So that will reduce some of the mission expense, and the money can be used to support these uh, uh, the target areas. So that's the fiscal. Policy adjustment. Multi policy, uh, as I said, the biggest issue is that where the credit growth will pick up again. And our understanding is that it's unlikely to happen. Uh, but the fine tuning, if you see that uh, uh, at least two, uh, in two areas, we see all this shifting of multi policy. Number one is the exchange rate policy. Uh, we are seeing that uh, uh, Chinese yuan uh, this year actually reverted this one side appreciation story this year and actually it depreciated by 3% uh, so far this year. So that, I would say, obviously one, at least one part of the reason is that to support export and to support the expand growth. The second that uh, in the liquidity policy or in the bank rate, uh, if you look at uh, in the bank rate, uh, last year actually kept on increasing in the second half of last year when the, the tightening is quite close. Uh, for this year, one interesting phenomenon is that in the bank rates start to decline and the liquidity condition is more stable. <coughs> so the idea is that uh, that will prevent these uh, funding costs for the business borrowers to further increase. So that's another adjustment done by this, uh, uh, the monetary policy authority. And the third area of the policy response is some supply side economic reform. Uh, which I think is a good news that that means that even that when the economic situation is facing trouble, uh, the policymakers still stick to these uh, uh, reform. That reform including say opening uh, private sector investment, uh, digital reform, financial reform, fiscal reform, and I believe that you will hear a lot of say uh, discussion on these reform areas in the next few days. So overall, if you put together that uh, uh, it's a combination of some. Uh, fine tuning the policy plus the structural reform, and they hopefully that uh, that will stabilize the growth. And that's the dynamic we have in mind. Uh, however, 
if you look at the, uh, the, the growth, if you look at the, uh, the, the our economic forecast here, is China able to achieve 7.5% growth target? Uh, our answer is no. Actually, our four-year forecast is 7.2%. And uh, we, we believe that uh, from a quarter-over-quarter perspective, actually, China economy will improve in the coming quarters. And several reasons is supporting this recovery story. Number one, uh, as I said, U.S. economy will pick up, and that will benefit China's export sector. And second, I would say, is benefiting from the pro-growth measures in the supported areas, as we just mentioned. And third is that uh, if you look at China's economic structure, manufacturing sector is having trouble at this moment. But there are other areas, say, for example, service sector. Now the share in the GDP is much bigger, but service sector growth is relatively stable. So that provides a decent cushion for the economic growth outlook. So these are the, uh, these positive factors behind China's economic growth. But we are more cautious that uh, we think this recovery or improvement is only very modest. And the, the four-year growth, uh, will drop, year over year growth will drop to 7% in the second half. Four years uh, will be uh, uh, below the 7.5 growth target. And let me mention several key concerns here. Number one is that, as I said, on the policy-wise, we do not expect substantial easing in the fiscal and the monetary policy. And actually, if you look at the both policies, there's some different degree of tightness in, on both fronts. Monetary policy, as I said, credit growth continue to slow down. That means there's uh, this negative effect on the economic growth. Uh, fiscal side, uh, on the, at the central level, if you look at the government uh, deficit number, roughly we're talking about similar number to last year. But the big difference is the local government. And we know that local government debt this year is becoming a more primary issue. So local government debt, they borrowed a lot of debt actually in the last two years. And this year, if you tighten rules on the local government, that means that uh, the actual fiscal deficit will be smaller this year. Again, that will be a tightening bias on the economic growth. And lastly, that I wanted to highlight one thing, that uh, housing market, again, housing market will be a major downside macro risk for this year. And here, uh, these few charts that we highlight say, uh, if you look at housing market activity, there's a big turning around at the beginning of this year. Transition volume turning from positive to negative growth. Again, that uh, inventory has been going up, and the floor space for affordable to fill is also increased. Okay. And so these are reflecting that the, the turning point of the housing market. And the bottom line is that China has built too much new homes in the last, last several years, and we're talking about generally oversupplying this market. So this market will lead to some adjustment in the coming years. And so how this housing market adjustment will affect the economy, uh, the Chinese economy? Here, let me highlight two things. Yeah, the first thing, we don't worry too much about financial risk. In the sense that uh, whether China house price will collapse, I think the property is very low. We probably see a modest adjustment process. But here, the second part, we worry more about the macro impact. The macro impact in maybe two areas. Number one is that if you look at the real investment growth will slow down, but real estate investment will have a major impact on the economic growth. Okay. And here, that uh, for this year, we expect that uh, the real, real estate housing market effect, uh, adjustment will cause a slowdown in real estate investment, and that will drag GDP growth by about half percentage point. That almost fully explains the decline in GDP grows from 7.7 .7 to 7.2. And if real estate investment this slowdown continues, that will put more pressure on the economic growth. So that's the most important channel in China. And the second, that it also affects the fiscal capacity by the local governments. Because Chinese local government, they rely a lot on the land sale levy. Last year, just to highlight one number, last year the land sale levy will increase from 2.6 trillion RMB to 4.2 trillion almost by 60% increase, but also 60% of budgetary revenue, the fiscal revenue for local governments. So it's a very important chunk of the funding sources for local governments. For this year, we expect land sale revenue to decline by 50 to 20%. So that's the, the additional, I'll say, the, the hit on the economy. So here the thing I want to highlight is that in China, the housing market adjustment is a major financial uh, macro risk. And transmission mechanism here is very important. When we think about China's housing market adjustment, the transmission is very different from the US or the other European countries. 
in US, all the ones he called me, so the channel typical thing is that when housing market starts to adjust, price will collapse, and the non-performing loan ratio will increase in the banking system, and banking system will suffer losses and face distress, and then it's spill over to the macro side. In China, the transmission trend mechanism probably just the reverse way. The biggest direct impact will be on the macroeconomic growth. And then the slow economic slowing will have bigger impact on the financial system. The non-performing loan ratio will increase, not only in the real estate sector, but also in manufacturing and many other sectors. So that's the uh, downside risk we need to worry uh, for this year. Okay. Uh, I think I'm running out of time. Just to summarize that uh, for this year, Again, we expect that uh, it's, a, it's a challenging year. Uh, the new leaders, they, they're going to push the economic reform. Uh, but um, there's some cyclical reason that economic growth may be, I would say, uh, be, uh, below their growth target. But let me highlight 7.2. Personally, I'm still optimistic because China is now a much bigger economy. It's the number two, uh, the, the second largest economy in the world. And even China, say, we're talking about 7% growth. That's still a very big increase. And 7% growth, if you talk about contribution to the global economy, we're still talking about 30% of contribution to the global. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. I think there's some uh, microphones at each side if you want to go out and you better always bring the microphone in and show that suit. Thank you. Thank you very much.